the silent woman. The uproarious merriment of a wedding feast burst forth into the night from a brilliantly lighted house in the gas, narrow street. It was one of those nights touched with the warmth of spring, but dark and full of soft mist. Most fitting it was for a celebration of the union of two yearning hearts to share the same lot, a lot that may possibly dawn in sunny brightness, but also become clouded and sullen, for a long, long time. But how merry and joyous they were over there, those people of the happy olden times. They, like us, had their troubles and trials, and when misfortune visited them it came not to them with soft cushions and tender pressures of the hand, rough and hard with clenched fist, it laid hold upon them. But when they gave vent to their happy feelings and sought to enjoy themselves, they were like swimmers in cooling waters. They struck out into the stream with freshness and courage, suffered themselves to be borne along by the current whithersoever it took its course. This was the cause of such a jubilee, such a thoughtlessly noisy outburst of all kinds of soul-possessing gaiety from this house of nuptials. And if I had known, the bride's father, the rich Reuben Klattner, had just said, that it would take the last golden in my pocket, then out it would have come. In fact, it did appear as if the last groschen had really taken flight, and was fluttering about in the form of platters heaped up with geese and pastry tarts. Since two o'clock, that is, since the marriage ceremony had been performed out in the open street. Until nearly midnight, the wedding feast had been progressing, and even yet the sarvers, or waiters, were hurrying from room to room. It was as if a twofold blessing had descended upon all this abundance of food and drink. For, in the first place, they did not seem to diminish. Secondly, they ever found a new place for disposal. To be sure, this appetite was sharpened by the presence of a little dwarf-like, unimportant-looking man. He was esteemed, however, nonetheless highly by everyone. They had specially written to engage the celebrated Lebnar, of Prague, and when was ever a mood so out of sorts, a heart so embittered as not to thaw out and laugh if Lev Nar played one of his pranks. Ah, thou art now dead, good fool. Thy lips, once always ready with a witty reply, are closed. Thy mouth then never still, now speaks no more. But when the hearty peals of laughter once rang forth at thy command, intercessors as it were, in thy behalf before the very throne of God, Thou hadst nothing to fear, and the joy of that other world was thine, that joy that has ever belonged to the most pious of country rabbis. In the meantime, the young people had assembled in one of the rooms to dance. It was strange how the sound of violins and trumpets accorded with the drolleries of the wit from Prague. In one part the outbursts of merriment were so boisterous that the very candles on the little table seemed to flicker with terror. In another an ordinary conversation was in progress, which now and then only ran over into a loud tittering, when some old lady slipped into the circle and tried her skill at a redowa, then altogether unknown to the young people. In the very midst of the tangle of dancers was to be seen the bride in a heavy silk wedding gown. The point of her golden hood hung far down over her face. She danced continuously. She danced with every one that asked her. Had one, however, observed the actions of the young woman, they would certainly have seemed to him hurried, agitated, almost wild. She looked no one in the eye, not even her own bridegroom. He stood for the most part in the doorway, and evidently took more pleasure in the witticisms of the fool than in the dance or the lady dancers. But who ever thought for a moment why the young woman's hand burned, why her breath was so hot when one came near to her lips, who should have noticed so strange a thing? A low whispering already passed through the company. A stealthy smile stole across many a lip. A bevy of ladies was seen to enter the room suddenly. The music dashed off into one of its loudest pieces, and, as if by enchantment, the newly made bride disappeared behind the ladies. The bridegroom, with his stupid, smiling mien, was still left standing on the threshold. But it was not long before he too vanished. One could hardly say how it happened. But people understand such skillful movements by experience, and will continue to understand them as long as there are brides and grooms in the world. This disappearance of the chief personages, little as it seemed to be noticed, gave, however, the signal for general leave-taking. The dancing became drowsy. It stopped all at once, as if by appointment. 
That noisy confusion now began which always attends so merry a wedding party. Half-drunken voices could be heard still intermingled with a last, hearty laugh over a joke of the fool from Prague echoing across the table. Here and there someone, not quite sure of his balance, was fumbling for the arm of his chair or the edge of the table. This resulted in his overturning a dish that had been forgotten, or in spilling a beer glass. While this, in turn, set up a new hubbub, someone else, in his eagerness to betake himself from the scene, fell flat into the very debris. But all this tumult was really hushed the moment they all pressed to the door, for at that very instant shrieks, cries of pain, were heard issuing from the entrance below. In an instant the entire outpouring crowd with all possible force pushed back into the room, but it was a long time before the stream was pressed back again. Meanwhile, painful cries were again heard from below, so painful, indeed, that they restored even the most drunken to a state of consciousness. By the living God, they cried to each other, What is the matter down there? Is the house on fire? She is gone. She is gone shrieked a woman's voice from the entry below. Who? Who? groaned the wedding guests, seized, as it were, with an icy horror. Gone. Gone! cried the woman from the entry, and hurrying up the stairs came Selda Klatner, the mother of the bride, pale as death, her eyes dilated with most awful fright, convulsively grasping a candle in her hand. For God's sake, what has happened? was heard on every side of her. The sight of so many people about her, and the confusion of voices, seemed to release the poor woman from a kind of stupor. She glanced shyly about her then, as if overcome with a sense of shame stronger than her terror, and said, in a suppressed tone, Nothing, nothing, good people. In God's name, I ask, what was there to happen? Dissimulation, however, was too evident to suffice to deceive them. Why, then, did you shriek so, Selda? Called out one of the guests to her. If nothing happened? Yes, she is gone. Selda now moaned in heart-rending tones, and she has certainly done herself some harm. The cause of this strange scene was now first discovered. The bride has disappeared from the wedding feast. Soon after that she had vanished in such a mysterious way, the bridegroom went below to the dimly lighted room to find her, but in vain. At first thought this seemed to him to be a sort of bashful jest, but not finding her here, a mysterious foreboding seized him. He called to the mother of the bride. Woe to me! This woman has gone. Presently this party, that had so admirably controlled itself, was again thrown into commotion. There was nothing to do, was said on all sides, but to ransack every nook and corner. Remarkable instances of such disappearances of brides had been known. Evil spirits were wont to lurk about such nights and to inflict mankind with all sorts of sorceries. Strange as this explanation may seem, there were many who believed it at this very moment, and most of all, Selda Klatner herself. But it was only for a moment, for she at once exclaimed, No, no, my good people, she is gone. I know she is gone. Now for the first time many of them, especially the mothers, felt particularly uneasy and anxiously called their daughters to them. Only a few showed courage and urged that they must search and search, even if they had to turn aside the river Iser a hundred times. They urgently pressed on, called for torches and lanterns, and started forth. The cowardly ran after them up and down the stairs. Before anyone perceived it the room was entirely forsaken. Reuben Klatner stood in the hall entry below, and let the people hurry past him without exchanging a word with any. Bitter disappointment and fear had almost crazed him. One of the last to stay in the room above with Zelda was, strange to say, Lebnar of Prague. After all had departed, he approached the miserable mother, and, in a tone least becoming his general manner, inquired, Tell me now, Mrs. Zelda, did she not wish to have him? Whom? Whom? cried Zelda, with renewed alarm, when she found herself alone with the fool. I mean, said Leb, in a most sympathetic manner, approaching still nearer to Zelda, that maybe you had to make your daughter marry him. Make? And have we, then, made her? moaned Zelda, staring at the fool with a look of uncertainty. Then nobody needs to search for her, 
replied the fool, with a sympathetic laugh, at the same time retreating. It's better to leave her where she is. Without saying thanks or good night, he was gone. Meanwhile, the cause of all this disturbance had arrived at the end of her flight. Close by the synagogue was situated the house of the rabbi. It was built in an angle of a very narrow street, set in a framework of tall shade trees. Even by daylight it was dismal enough. At night, it was almost impossible for a timid person to approach it, for people declared that the low supplications of the dead could be heard in the dingy house of God when at night they took the rolls of the law from the ark to summon their members by name. Through this retired street passed, or rather ran, at this hour a shy form. Arriving at the dwelling of the rabbi, she glanced backward to see whether anyone was following her. But all was silent and gloomy enough about her. A pale light issued from one of the windows of the synagogue. It came from the eternal lamp hanging in front of the Ark of the Covenant. But at this moment it seemed to her as if a supernatural I was gazing upon her. Thoroughly affrighted, she seized the little iron knocker of the door and struck it gently. But the throb of her beating heart was even louder, more violent, than this blow. After a pause, footsteps were heard passing slowly along the hallway. The rabbi had not occupied this lonely house a long time. His predecessor, almost a centenarian in years, had been laid to rest a few months before. The new rabbi had been called from a distant part of the country. He was unmarried and in the prime of life. No one had known him before his coming. But his personal nobility and the profundity of his scholarship made up for his deficiency in years. An aged mother had accompanied him from their distant home, and she took the place of wife and child. Who is there? asked the rabbi, who had been busy at his desk even at this late hour and thus had not missed hearing the knocker. It is I, the figure without responded, almost inaudibly. Speak louder, if you wish me to hear you, replied the rabbi. It is I, Reuben Klatner's daughter, she repeated. The name seemed to sound strange to the rabbi. He as yet knew too few of his congregation to understand that this very day he performed the marriage ceremony of the person who had just repeated her name. Therefore he called out, after a moment's pause, What do you wish so late at night? Open the door, rabbi, she answered, pleadingly, or I shall die at once. The bolt was pushed back, something gleaming, rustling, glided past the rabbi into the dusky hall. The light of the candle in his hand was not sufficient to allow him to descry it. Before he had time to address her, she had vanished past him and had disappeared through the open door into the room. Shaking his head, the rabbi again bolted the door. On re-entering the room, he saw a woman's form sitting in the chair which he usually occupied. She had her back turned to him. Her head was bent low over her breast. Her golden wedding hood, with its shading lace, was pulled down over her forehead. Courageous and pious as the rabbi was, he could not rid himself of a feeling of terror.